people who indicated they couldn't make it. Um, I think we may be above the numbers expected given that. But okay, so um, first Dan asked about the 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 technical problem solution questions. Could I give examples of the types of questions being asked? And Juan uh, came in and said, when testing a function, should we also create test cases that cover the preconditions? Um, uh, now, uh, I'm going to answer Dan's question first, but to do that, I'm going to I'm going to do so by way of Juan's question, um, giving, you know, just noting that Juan was asking about one type of technical question that could be posed um, about creating test cases. Um, there are, however, uh, other types. Um, uh, I could give, for example, a set of code and ask you to identify transitions that um, would need to be covered by test cases. Uh, I could uh, ask for you to provide specifications uh, for for some code, uh, and you know, uh, provide provide a specification that describes what this code does in a structured way, so preconditions, postconditions, um, uh, that could be used by users of this code to help um, help their understanding of uh, what can be expected by the code, what is guaranteed by the code, and which would be a contract which the creators of that code uh, would need to live by as the code itself, the implementation evolves. Um, there might be uh, other types of questions as well that are that are technical. For example, um, given a description of a situation, uh, find some boundary cases, uh, or find uh, some identify some equivalence classes. And T is for testing. Um, there are. There were topics that we have discussed um, also on the in, in, in certain areas like mocking, uh, which might be amenable to a question. For example, um, if we wanted to uh, test a module A, uh, which uh, in isolation, even though it uses uh, some other some other components, say B and C um uh, what you know how what technology might we use for for performing that test or what what methodology and um what what information could we collect that might be helpful um when using that process to identify whether a is working properly and what i have in mind there is a mocking and in the mocking you might check, for example, that B and C are being call, called with reasonable arguments, um, with non-null values, for example, or with arrays that are sorted as specified, or um, cases where we have uh, a, a data structure being passed that's in the right format. So mocking can help us by observing whether the information being passed back and forth um, across a boundary is uh, observes uh, preconditions, uh, for example, or or post conditions. Um, so um, those are some technical types of problems which uh, which could be asked, and I think those are um, would be some good ones to to think about. Um, so uh, Bob says, is the take-home portion of the exam mentioned in the syllabus referring to the post-mortem? It's referring to the post-mortems, uh, yes, um, that's right. So, so the idea here is that you are allowed to offload the work uh, from the exam of filling out the individual post-mortem um, and, in fact, the group post-mortem by, um, by filling those out separate from the exam. 
and um, you are, you know, technically they're part of the exam, but you're allowed essentially to turn them in uh, on the day of the exam without taking your exam time to fill those out. Uh, so, so that's what's called, uh, that's what I term a take home portion of the exam. Um, the, one of the reasons for doing this is that, uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, at a, uh, level of, of the rules of, uh, classes, I'm not allowed to assign content, uh, after the last day of class. Um, so. Uh, I can allow things to be turned in, but I, I can't assign it except as a part of a, of a take-home exam. So you are allowed to provide post-mortem comments on the exam. Um, there's a space for that, and uh, it it welcomes it. But it's um, it's something which, you know, I recommend you do separately for the exam so, so that you don't have to take the time uh, on the exam itself. Hopefully that's helpful to understand. Uh, Matthew asked, uh, in regards to the additional questions, if we're submitting the individual postmortems, would you still like us to summarize it or perform more details in those additional questions on the exam? Uh, that's not necessary. Um, I spend a great deal of time reviewing the individual postmortems. Um, uh, it's a it's quite a major task in a class this size, um, even though they're limited to two pages. Uh, and um, if if you feel that captures your experience, there's neither it's neither recommended nor required for you to to add you know a comment uh, summary of it or whatever. You can be sure that I will read it now if. If there were some aspect of the situation that you realized, you know, you had really left out when submitting the individual postmortems, um, and you already submitted it, you you could indicate that on the exam. But honestly, if you're happy with your individual postmortem, it's it's a lot easier for me if I don't have to kind of merge the two in my mind. Um, uh, and uh, and give credit for um, the content for both. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so uh, Ardalan asks, can I ask a question? Yes, Ardalan, you can ask a question. So my question was, um, so it is either the personal uh, postmortem that we can fill out on our own, or we can do it uh, in the exam part of the question. So. I'm just trying to make understand that's correctly. So in the exam, we have after like the portion of the main mark, we have a few questions about who parts with how much and those kind of stuff. Can we do that in the personal version rather than doing it inside the exam? Because I'm more concerned that I will be able to you know get to that portion of the ex portion of it and give the credit to my uh, members. You know. Uh, no, that's it's 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 part of the exam um, okay. content, and you have to do it uh, as part of the exam. It'll be a nightmare for me if I have to search everyone's individual postmortems just in case they've put that information there. That information does not, if you don't get to it, it doesn't take away from your uh, from your mark at all. So it it won't be it won't disadvantage you you know, that you, it won't, you know, take off from your mark, but I need this, I need the items um, placed in a centralized place. Otherwise, you know, I'll have what, 40 something individual postmortems uh, scattered around. And it, it's, it's hard enough when I'm dealing with 40 responses for comments on their different um, teammates. It's, it's harder yet if I have to go scrounge around for it in the, uh, in the individual postmortems, uh, so uh, you know, it's I I uh, will need that information, that structured information, uh, in the exam uh, itself. Sure, sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, are we permitted to return to previous questions in the exam? Um, uh, yes, you are. 
you're allowed to go back and forth. And uh, as I recall, there's a little flag that you can use when filling out the exam uh, questions, which will indicate like you flag this for your attention. So you can easily come back and find the ones that, you know, you weren't sure about and you felt you needed more time, but you didn't want to, um, uh, you didn't want to take the time at the moment. You can come back and, and address those again. And I do suspect there will be time to do that. I mean, I, as I say, I think the exam is, uh, is smaller um, than many have delivered. And I do think that one of the advantages, one of the reasons I've made it a bit smaller is to provide a little bit more opportunity for students to reflect on their answers, to go back, uh, correct things, um, and to be a bit more measured in, in how they go through it. I do think it'll be important to pace yourself going through it, but you can use that flag to, to you know, uh, go back and return to things you feel need more thought. Um, uh, if we are testing, a, a, yeah, so Ardalan helpfully put a comment saying you can go back, and that's correct. If we are testing a boundary like, oh, yeah, there was a, there was a question earlier. I don't think I answered um, uh, Juan's question. When testing a function, should we also create test cases that cover the preconditions? So I had noted in my um, yeah, in my comments on this in class that there's two schools of thought on this, um, and um. One school of thought is that, um, you know, like a contract, um, uh, that that um, one is making with a firm or what have you, um, you um, you have to abide by that contract, and the contract itself um, may not uh, may not dictate you know, what happens when you, um, when you don't there. Um, so, well, okay. So, you know, there, there's a school of thought that, that abiding by the preconditions and the behavior in the absence of the preconditions um, is the responsibility of the user, uh, the person who's say calling that function. So if I call a function, violating its preconditions um that it shouldn't be the burden of the the called function designers to handle those cases um and uh it's really a matter of testing on the side of the caller that you know it's it's abided by um by those preconditions that's required the burden should be on the caller on the client not the provider of the service. Uh, the provider of the service specifies a contract, and uh, it should the burden should be on the uh, on the client as to whether or not they uh, uh, if, as to any extra work if they if they're not willing to abide by that. Now, I, I think as good testing practice, we're, we're all aware that um, that will sometimes have cases where there's inadvertent um, misuse uh, of a class method function, you know, uh, some other type of service within our code. And we, we find that whether due to oversight, misunderstanding, um, carelessness, what have you, uh, we're not abiding by those preconditions. And um, I do think that testing on the side of the um, of of the service provider of the person who's providing this code with these preconditions is a good practice. I think it's it, in, in, while well, in principle, you might say there shouldn't be a burden on that party testing for those preconditions. Um, uh, is is a is a good thing, and responding to them 
in some sort of principled way, be it throw an exception, be it return an, uh, an error code, uh, be it, you know, to, to have uh, an assertion failure. Um, I do think that's a good practice. I think it's low enough burden that it's easily done. And so as such, Juan, I would view tests of a given set of code, which tests violation, the behavior when violating the preconditions um, as valid tests, as long as they're explicitly made to indicate that, um, you know, it, it indicates for the test goal, you know, um, confirm, uh, you know, error under this condition or uh, that, that, yeah, an error is used to flag this condition. So normally in test cases, you provide some input and you get some output. And um, in this case, uh, you know, that the nature of the output that you get um, might not be specified by the by the contract. But if for that code base, it's agreed, for example, that it will throw an exception or there'll be an assertion failure, um, you can simply state that in your answer um, and that you will test, you know, for such a failure um, in those cases. Uh, generally speaking, though, when we're, like so so that is a okay thing to do but what i don't want to see if you're listing a bunch of tests of code is most of the tests before cases where the precondition is not held after all the, your goal uh maybe to i mean your goal is generally to evaluate whether or not this is correctly indicated and while that is some component of its functionality there sh there should at least be substantive attention paid to checking cases where preconditions do hold and ensuring that you know the uh, the post conditions are met that it that it's worked properly right um that it returns the correct answer um i i would not want to see you know a a, a set of test cases purely filled with testing behavior when the preconditions uh, do not hold. That would not be a balanced type of testing uh, of a um, of a function or a, or a, a method, et cetera. So I hope that's uh, that's helpful. So I'm, I'm just looking through here. Um, so Eric was asking, if we're testing a boundary like zero less than or equal to x, should we only test x equals zero, x equals minus one, or should we also include a value of one uh, to check if zero fails? Um, if zero fails, that we can determine that it's only an off by one error or a larger issue. Yeah, with boundary cases, um, it is good to check the boundary and then neighboring neighboring values. Um, and so if there's a, um, a piece of code that, you know, expects a value that's um, zero or more, certainly you want to check it with zero. Uh, you want to check it with minus one because you want to make sure it does not work. Um, uh, well, excuse me. Um, uh, so it depends if this is a precondition or postcondition, et cetera. But in any case, testing around the boundary is a good thing. So zero minus one plus one, I think, is it's a reasonable thing because often we do have off by one errors. And you may want to check that zero and one are, are um, both handled uh, in a comparable way. Uh, Kamal is asking, if there would be additional time to write the individual postmortem of the exam, we're choosing to write it to, during the exam be taken out of our exam time. Yeah, it's 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 allowed as a take home component precisely to deal with to if you if you don't want to take it out of your exam time, you would 
you would do it ahead of time uh, and and uh, you would turn it in separately. Um, but the option is they are doing it part of the exam. It's not required as part of the it's not required as part of the in-person uh, exam that you must do it there. But you could turn it in. Um, you could turn it in separately um, instead. And that would be the way to avoid any taking of time from the exam. Um, so if we have submitted our postmortem before we plan to turn the postmortem after the test, can we? Yes, you can leave it. The question empty. Most students leave it empty because they've turned in their postmortem or they're turning it in separately. Yeah. Either one, before or after. Will any of the questions require use of a calculator? No, there's no questions. So require use of electronic device um, uh, other than the computer in which you're you're filling it out and you won't be using a calculator on there. There's, there's no need for that. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, other questions? No Greek symbols, no calculators, um, nothing, you know, no drawing things, no equations, uh, no, no, you know, mathematical, special mathematical symbols. No. Um, diagrams or graphs? No. Nope, nothing like that. There have been some past versions of this uh, of this class where mm -hmm. I have required those sort of things, but um, uh, that's that's not part of my plan here, and it won't be on the exam. Other questions before I talk through some some material? I had one more question. Uh, oh, I'm gonna ask a question, sorry. Um, uh, so uh, I had previously mentioned four types of questions. Uh, true or false, fill in the blank, short answer, and the sort of longer, more technical analysis, what I call um, analytic questions, where you're not quite the right word, but you're you're being asked to to reason through something and and offer an answer based on on analysis. So the yeah, question. Those are the four. Mm -hmm. The question that I had was, uh, I was watching your previous, um, you know, final exam review sessions, and you mentioned in one of yep. them that the true-false questions, you can bring reasoning there. So is it a choice of true or false, or we can say true, and then we can explain why we think that is true or false? Yes, it's that that one, yeah. So um, I explicitly made it uh, for this year that uh, instead of being simply true or false uh that you, you do have to say true or false but you can provide your reasoning and um the general principle is there that uh i will credit a correct answer um but if the answer is wrong I may give partial or even in some cases full credit if the reasoning is sensible. So um although I I have doubts whether any of whether this would apply for the exam in this case, uh there are times where I've had an exam and students have given an answer that um, it's a true false question. I expect the uh, a certain answer. They give the opposite one, but it shows that they are 
you know, uh, reasoning about it at a um, a level of detail that um, was not required, and uh, but but demonstrates a deeper understanding uh, about the issue, and so that and, and and a deeper understanding whereby, in another sense, the other answer, you know. Um, could be correct, false, or what have you. Um, uh, so, so in those cases, I I do try to give full credit because they say, okay, look, the student understands the basic issue. They're just analyzing it at a level that I wasn't asking. Um, but it's clear they from their answers that they understood at the level I was looking for uh, the basics. It's just they're they're providing more more detailed analysis than than was being sought. So yes, I I do give credit, and I have mixed feelings about that because you know generally exams take about an hour per student for me to mark, and uh, you know th that can that can make it longer because um it's easier if I only have to mark true or false but um uh, but it is something that um i think might allow better um assessment of, of student judgment so i've 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 gone back and and uh re, re enabled that um yeah um if we just say true or false without a reason no you won't you won't lose any marks um that's what i said you i first mark well let me let me clarify when i say you, you won't lose marks so so what i was saying is the first order so you so you're keep being given marks in true false questions uh based on a hierarchy of marking the first thing in the hierarchy is is it correct is it the answer I expect? And if it is the answer I expect, I will just assign full marks and I'm I'm not going to bother reading the the reason. Um, or at least I, I've no need to do that. You're you're getting full marks. And occasionally I, I'm I'm you know, I regret that because someone gives full marks and they give no no significant like they give a poor reason for it. But I feel bound to give them the marks because this is what I promised. And then, and and then, uh, and then if if they got it wrong, then I use the reasoning to see if I can award partial marks. So, um, you know, leaving out a reason um, uh, is 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 not going to deduct anything from your mark if you got it correct um it might it might get in the way of partial marks if you didn't get it correct um and uh and so you know that's that's where if there's if there were a loss that's where it would be uh hmm that's kind of what i'm currently thinking but this discussion is making me wonder maybe i should require Hmm. I'll think about that. Um, yeah, that that's my current plan. It's possible it will change by tomorrow morning. Um, uh, that I'll I'll actually read the answers and use them uh, to override in either case. But um, uh, but certainly, if you give a if you give the correct answer without a reason. Uh, right now, I have no plan to to challenge that. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I will say. Um, give me, give me a moment. Um,
apologies, folks. Um, just a, a rare, uh, rare call that it could have indicated a great urgency. Um, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll maybe think about refining my my comments on that. But certainly, um, my plan is to allow a correct answer without a reason um, to be given uh, full credit. Okay, other questions? <laughs> Are all the students getting different sets of questions? I'm not gonna answer that question. Um, I, I have no obligation to answer it, and I have no intention of answering it. <laughs> uh, I'm also not going to answer uh, anything about the the number of questions, numbering of questions, whether they're those are the same. I am familiar with with exam uh, mechanics. Other questions? Okay. Um, if there are no questions, I'm going to talk about um, some of the material then. Uh, now, in those other videos, you'll find me going on for several hours uh, um, So what slide did we finish path coverage lecture again? Um, uh, so there was a uh, a lecture where I have slides from path coverage. And we went through node uh, and transition, that is edge coverage. We talked about the notion of subsumption of, of uh, the subsumption hierarchy for testing and uh, said what it means for coverage level A to subsume coverage level B. And we noted that certain coverage strategies uh, achieved particularly strong coverage. And I specifically highlighted the strength of node-based coverage Uh, excuse me, node-based coverage. What am I saying? Particularly highlighted the, the strength of um, prime path coverage of code, um, which, um, uh, which assured a level of testing stronger than node, stronger than edge, uh, stronger than round trip, uh, stronger than edge pair coverage. And I noted that prime path coverage um, uh, involved a technical procedure that was fairly routine to calculate in which in past years I've gone through uh, with class. You'll find videos of me speaking about prime paths and prime path coverage um, and how to systematically enumerate the prime paths within code. Um, coverage, so that material on prime path coverage was not covered, pun intended, nor is it required. Uh, it was not covered in class and it, it's not required for the exam. It's not uh, within the scope of the exam. So that's, 
what is though? I mean, I, I certainly expect an understanding. We did talk about the general process that cuts across all coverage techniques, node coverage, edge coverage, for that matter, edge pair coverage, prime path indeed. Um, which, which involved identifying the set of things you want to cover, formulating a set of paths from start to finish, which reach those things. And thirdly, identifying a set of specific concrete test cases. So test cases with particular inputs and particular outputs expected. And the output could be, you know, a thrown exception that exercised those paths. Those were the three invariants that held across all, all those types of, of, of coverage testing. You figure out the set of things you want to hit in your coverage. You figure out paths which hit those things, and then you figure out the test cases that will exercise those paths, that will get them to go those ways that will cover those items. Those were all part of our test coverage, prime path cover testing. The details of prime path coverage lay outside the scope of what we were, what we reached. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about um, some notable topics that we covered here. Maybe some of them will bring up questions. And I've, I've got the chat window up in a different monitor here uh for for discussion um so if people want to put forward questions you're welcome to do so um so we talked about peer reviews and inspections talked a fair bit about well well you tell me i'm, I'm gonna make this more interactive you tell me like what are some types of peer review? Give me give me some types of peer review that differ in formality. Inspections, work through. Good, uh, good. Desk check, yeah. Ad hoc, yeah, yeah. Um, I might call ad hoc desk check. Yeah, uh, how about one or two more? Are there some that, yeah, pair programming, darn right. Yeah, exactly. Good, good. Um. Uh, and... Code reviews, um, I would I would credit the sort of reviews that are done as part of a pull request, right? Um, there uh, are what else to be covered, yeah, and and walkthroughs too. Good. Um, uh, we talked about continuous integration. Give me some things other than than a compilation, the compiling code that would be commonly part of continuous integration pipelines. Give me some some other things you might want to do besides, yeah, smoke testing, excellent. Linter, yes. I think some pipelines still don't have linters in them, I think. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll discuss that next week with some of the groups, try to find out we weren't able. Containerization is a good thing, yeah. Yeah, um, possibly pushing even to Docker Hub or something. Um, Unit testing, yeah. So these suites of tests, security review, yeah. Regression tests, potentially regression tests for sure, like certain branches of it. The, in in large professional projects, the, the set of regression tests may get so large, you can't run it upon, you know, very, very frequently, but, but you might run it in a nightly build on a cron job or something like that. I know at least one group had a cron job in their, in their, um, uh, and their YAML file I saw. Um, and auto deployment, that's exactly right, yeah. So continuous integration, these continuous integration builds that are such a big part of DevOps have this, um, you know, this expansive set of possibilities of what you could do. Sometimes you even rebuild the database, the testing database, because the test schema has evolved and you wanna, you know, rebuild it and repopulate it, et cetera. Um, uh, we talked some about code contracts and specifications, less than I would have liked to in this class. Uh, 
in okay. some past years, I've I've really gone into much more detail about putting together good specifications, formulating these descriptions of what code does in a contract type form rather than making commitments as to exactly how it does it. Um, specifying the properties that a code guarantees. You know, maybe it's that the array being returned um, is in ascending sorted order considered lexicographically um, rather than saying, you know, it's sorted through bubble sort or sorted through quick sort. That's the how, the sorted through quick sort, bubble sort, or merge sort or heap sort or whatever. Um, the property that's guaranteed is that you have this ordering of the array being returned or that you know each key in the in the dictionary is guaranteed to be independent or that there are no you know values in the dictionary that are that are null or what have you um but specifications play a particularly key uh role in and we'll come back to that in a few minutes likely we talked about testing um Talked a lot about testing, general principles, path-based testing a little bit, um, testability. Um, what are some ways we can improve testability in a system? Give me, give me some ways we can improve testability. Use of assertions, mocks, hooks. Yes, yes. Okay, logging. Yes, having good test harnesses. Darn right. Multi-level logging, crash analytics. I love it. I love it. Specifications can actually can actually increase separation of concerns. Yeah, and, uh, separation of interface and implementation. Exactly, where the interface provides the specification, the contracts. Yeah, modularization. We can, you know, by breaking things up into pieces, we can test the interface. Like as things are being called into them, we can test that it's that that the things being passed are prop are. are are, are proper. We can specify the properties that have to be guaranteed by those things that that are that are being called there. We can we can better specify what's expected. We can replace that thing with a mock. Um, yes, uh, I love it. Um, a good naming standards and clean code. Darn right. Yeah, testing parts separately. Yeah, separation of concerns. If you could test the the um the ui separately from the from the business logic from the uh the data layer um yeah containerization can help regression testing i love it i love it um okay i say a bit of testing for object oriented systems that that's actually we didn't really um cover that this year and and um oh my gosh wait a minute i'm I some something screwed up here because I had um it, um that's really weird uh that okay sorry um I I must have screwed up because I meant to remove these um these are things we've covered in some previous years um we did talk a little bit about requirement solicitation risk management and uh there um so apologies um so i have a sense of deja vu here not sure what happened to the earlier version of this maybe i'm using the version from last year or something like that um in any case um uh requirement solicitation we discussed Why do we discuss requirement solicitation? Can anyone say? Having accurate and agreed upon requirements between and uh, your development team leads to less risky code as well as makes development overall cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yep, I, I think that's uh, good to say. So so it's less likely code will be thrown out, but also less likely designs will be thrown out, less likely that 
you know, uh, certain types of tests will have to be thrown out because they're they're not proving relevant. Um, you know, generally in life, it's if you want to go somewhere, it's a good thing to know where you want to go. And requirements are kind of like that, where you want to go, right? The thing you want to produce, the features of the thing you want to produce, the characteristics that will make it a successful system in the eyes of the stakeholder. And if you don't have a very good understanding of that, um, you may wander around before eventually getting to that place and, you know, go through all sorts of swamps or all sorts of unhelpful roads, dangerous roads, or you could have gone more more straight there. So it's it's not efficient. And it it also undercuts stakeholder confidence and trust and and um happiness with the with the project, right? And it it leads to a lot of unnecessary work. Um and you can put the time saved into other things like assuring higher quality code, assuring, you know, that it's been well peer reviewed, well inspected and well tested, et cetera. You could put that extra time into better features that'll make that stakeholder, you know, even more pleased, right? And the time taken to kind of wander around until you finally get it right may also be time where the stakeholder's needs change and, and you're it's piling on the amount of, of, of change that's needed uh, in your system. Um, the amount of effort required to deal with a requirements problem. It's often you know, a problem that arises that early. The, the later and later it goes in the process before you find it, often the amount of work that's required to fix it goes up exponentially. Um, yeah, and then there's derived requirements, Utsav mentions, and that's exactly right. Very perceptive, yeah. So there's, from user requirements, there's all these derived requirements, all these things that flow from them. You know, so someone says, "Hey, I want to, I want to run this on, you know, uh, on my Android and I and, and I want to have support people with both Android and iPhone." And you know, for us as developers, that tells us a whole lot of things. Like, okay, we got to think here. Okay, either they're talking about like doing it through a browser which could be accessed on either iPhone or Android, or we're talking about cross-platform development, which is like React Native, uh, Flutter, or progressive web apps. Um, and suddenly it's it's saying, okay, we've got these concrete things. We have to figure out there's all these extra implications. And of course, if if you end up saying, okay, we're going to do it with, um, or or we have to, do it separately in native code bases. And if you say, okay, we have to do it in native code bases, then we're talking different APIs, right? Um, uh, for each of them, um, different uh, different programming languages, different skill sets, often different developers for each of them. Um, yeah, and it, it reduces ambiguity. And generally, you know, like requirements that are misunderstood can also have very material impact on morale So, right? Um, yeah, having helping future devs have an easier time. Uh, stakeholders may not know exactly what they need. That's 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 definitely the case. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they have a general inkling of the features that they want to have in the system. They know what they don't want. Sometimes, um, they know what certain things it needs to adhere to, but they may not, generally they won't have a, a very clear vision. There are exceptions, but most of them just don't have a very clear vision of you know what the interface would look like or, or what particular detailed features it have. And it's a co-design process of discussing it with them and, and thinking it through and help them understand the non, you know, the, uh, the implications which are totally non-obvious for them, of making different choices. You know, this is going to take a lot of work. That would be really easy. This is hard on a cross-platform basis, what have you, that um, uh, that is, that, you know, is needed for them to kind of converge. Um, yeah, the technical implications of their decisions are not clear. It's exactly right. 
Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a stakeholder won't necessarily understand the concurrency impacts, the, the security side needs. So there's a co-design component. It's not merely sitting with them and saying, what do you want and, and copying it down and doing it. There's a lot more to it that that involves um, uh, working with them towards a vision that has that right balance of time frame functionality, you know, addressing their needs, um, risk, uh, feasibility, um, and, and, and some non-functional requirements, right? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Lot, lots of good comments here. Um, yeah, you can document area system before you implement or review it. We could drive many assertion checks. Yeah, so sometimes you, you can from from these things. Create test cases easier. Well, at least define them easier if you know some some requirements. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, requirements have this really big impact. And I know it seems squishy, but there's... there's um, you know, work afoot to, to make it clear. But at the end of the day, you, you often need that dialogue, right? Um, risk management um, is something we've talked a lot about. Um, the difference uh, between simply accepting a risk or putting in place a contingency plan, something we will do if it comes about, um, but we're not typically paying a lot for it if it doesn't happen. Um, we're all coordinated if it does. And then the this uh and, and then also, you know, mitigation plans, which serve to do one of two things. What does a mitigation plan do? Can anyone tell me what what does a mitigation plan accomplish? It reduces likelihood and impact of the risk. Exactly. So it, it lowers the possibility of it occurring or in, in both the mitigation measures, or if it does occur, it it lowers the the impact. So some mitigation plans are focused on, on probability, some are more focused on impact, some are focused on both, right? Um uh and uh that's exactly right. Um give me a second, I'm just gonna um get a pen here so I uh, note some things down. Yeah. Um, good. Um, okay. Um, and we talked some about um, multi-tier architectures. The main, the main thing I I, I wanted to you know, convey about multi-tier architectures. Well, there's a few things. One is the idea of separation of concerns. Um, and the fact that we have the ability to test, um, for example, lower layers um, without needing all the stack on top of them. And in a good such system, you might be able to test a higher layer by mocking out lower layers, for example. But another thing, you know, that I also wanted to emphasize was the fact when you have these multi-tier architectures, often you can get a certain amount of, of modularity because the lower layers may be used by several upper layers. So maybe you have a web-based UI, which is using your business logic and using your 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 back end your your data layer but maybe you also have a mobile device which is connecting via endpoints and being routed to 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 use the business logic and the the bis and the um the database layer so you have you know different types of user interfaces provide different top level layers and they they use common layers lower down um uh, we can also 
uh, in this context, uh, nicely yet partition out different sorts of needs as far as handling things like concurrency, um, uh, multiple uh, access. And, and here, what I argued is, you know, in a web context, particularly, um, there's a need for to, to soundly handle many users accessing the system uh, at the same time. And we talked some about the acid properties. Does anyone remember those that, that, that play a big role in concurrency? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so the acid, the A is, is atomicity. Good. Consistency. Good. Yeah. Durability is the D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isolated or, or independent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like item potent, but uh, yeah, something is, is item potent if 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 applying it twice is the same as applying it once. Um, but uh, that's less directly relevant to to the atomic consistency, isolated isolation or or independent and and durable. Um, and the idea here is that when we have many concurrent users we have to take seriously um, the fact that several of them may be concurrent and and in the case particularly in the case of slow operations sometimes the piece of data being being manipulated by one overlap with the pieces of data by the other and to have it be um uh correct and and uh and and sound in its design um to do the correct things we have to handle this concurrency correctly um we can't have uh something where you know we make some promise to someone only to have the ability to deliver on that promise undercut by someone else's action. So the example I think I gave from a shopping site was, you know, person A goes to buy something um, and uh, they're charged for it and it's about to be shipped by them and person B um, uh, has just completed their transaction for it, takes it and, and it's unavailable for the first person. Um, and the first person is charged, but doesn't receive it uh, because this other person was concurrent with them. And we we don't want that. We need these these uh, types of interactions to occur in transactions, which either occur completely or not at all. That's the atomicity idea. They either fully occur or it's as if they don't occur at all. And and they're consistent. Um, you, you you can't, you know, there's a there's a danger if one person only gets part way through that it may be in it left in an inconsistent state. And you need, if failure occurs and failure will occur sometimes, a transaction needs to. What happens to a transaction if failure occurs in it? Let's suppose the database isn't available because. The network has gone down or let's suppose someone else has taken the item they're depending on it, it, so they can't get it after all yeah it's rolled back so the whole thing exactly is rolled back it's as if they never did it so you need this kind of this abstraction of um okay i'm, I'm going to undertake this task and maybe this task will span several databases maybe it'll involve writing different files maybe it'll involve you know um reserving certain types of goods or what have you. Um, so it's a quite complicated process maybe um, that has to be coordinated. And if there's a failure anywhere in that such that it can't be delivered, if, if that the whole thing can't be delivered, the whole thing has to be rolled back as if you never did it at all, as if those files were never written, as if those things in those different databases were never 
never changed or whatever. And that's a that's a you know challenging thing, but it's an important thing when we have multiple concurrent users, because otherwise my going on, I could see what's going on in yours at the same time, or I could interfere with what's going on in yours. It could leave you in an inconsistent state where you're charged and you haven't gotten the good or what have you. It's not, it can't be shipped to you or it's shipped to you and, and they don't get the money, you know, the, the, the merchant. So in short, um, we need these guarantees of atomicity, concurrency, isolation, or independence and durability. Um, we need that to be fault tolerant. We need it, in fact, to be to be scalable. Um, we need it to handle these large numbers of users interacting concurrently. And um, we have ways in our in our layered systems. Uh, for ensuring that um, and and for providing those sort of guarantees with things like business logic layers and data layers uh, that have these uh, these guarantees for concurrency. Um, so I, I, I do want to just make a remark, folks. I, I'm going to pop out of this just for a just for a moment, because you know we're we're not going to be able to talk about um, all these slides, and and um, I, I just want to convey one one important thing. So this semester, um, more so than than past semesters, um, I uh, I consciously designed this course to prioritize discussion with the class. Discussion that often crossed into the issues with projects and, and talk about issues with projects. And I did so purposefully and consciously aware that there was an opportunity cost. What's an opportunity cost, folks? Can anyone say? What is a, when you I say- You might actually uh, start mm -hmm. working on, uh, you might have many different choices, but according to their value and according to your priority, you will choose to be like, okay, I will do this, even though I will lose these great features, but it will help me to go to get to some very specific, or so, for example, software. Well, so that's often the case of it, but it's, it's, it's the value of the thing foregone. So when I choose A, I give up often and inevitably B and C. And in this class, I deliberately gave up certain topics. I traded candy for gold. It wasn't candy. It was it was more like silver, um, uh, silver and in and, and bronze or something. Um, uh, I traded it for for gold for the discussion. And and I think yeah, actually the answers that I'm getting here in this session and the discussions I'm having in the group meetings and with students in my office, et cetera suggest that it was a good choice that that there's been a level of added understanding beyond you know just what lectures would give because so much of this the learning of this class is in the trenches right it's in the it's in the uh, the doing it's in the enactment in the projects right um and uh that's not something I can convey directly in a lecture, but it is something I can facilitate in a lecture by dialogue and, and by discussion and by, you know, uh, by our meetings with the groups for every deliverable, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so this, uh, I appreciate Jesse's comments um, uh, there. I, I tried to, I, I recognize it was foregoing certain coverage, and there's a lot we could have covered additionally, you know, on on paper material. And and actually, it's some important ideas with Liskov substitution principle and testing and object oriented systems, and more on specification design, and, you know, formal um, uh, formal uh, means of of reasonable correctness, et cetera. But um, I I thought, you know, that that I I'd, I'd really put that emphasis on that on that those dialogues and that um more immersive learning experience so uh i i, I appreciate the feedback there because it was a um 
uh, it was a uh, risk. It was a, um, you know, a, a, a trial. Um, but I'm glad if, if you felt it was useful. I will further say that um, what it has meant, in, <laughs> and I don't think you folks will be mourning it, is is an exam that's smaller. Um, you know, I I could have. I could have crammed more into the, to the, I could have done a lot more in lecture if I'd used the time to lecture, right? Um, uh, and the exam will be a lot bigger. Um, and uh, there are some things foregone. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm really glad if you feel it was a, a you know, a trade off um, that was well worth it. Um, the benefit ex exceeded the the cost. Um, and, you know, I get the sense of some extra understanding here, which I'm really pleased about. Um, you know, we much of this course is about acting purposely ahead of the time, flying ahead of the plane, taking proactive steps, right, to head off problems, head off risks head off technical issues, to spike prototypes, to test things out, right, uh, beforehand. Work with the stakeholder to understand the needs. Um, lower the vulnerabilities, right? Um, it's about um, risk management at some level. Uh, pardon me for just a second. My computer is, is uh, engaging in, in, in thrashing uh, behavior, and I just want to um, I just want to calm that down so uh, we don't get um, we don't get a impaired experience here. Uh, you know, if you if you think about your projects, a lot of them are involving balancing uncertainties, risks, right? Um, and 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 taking action that will give you flexibility that will let you. I have flexibility mocking things out, flexibility in testing things, flexibility in who does what, who does what work in a project, right? Um, this whole, I know, I know it was hard on you, but this whole switching of devs and testers, right? Um, I know it's painful, but it gave you some flexibility. I get the sense that the fact that the testers had worked as devs, sometimes on the same products they're working on now, the same components they're working on as testers, let it gave them a certain versatility, and um, and and you know the fact that the testers had been or the devs on that had been testers before maybe gave them access to some additional um, some additional tools, right? Um, uh, I think it may be obvious, but um, a lot of the a lot of the problems in the world more generally, I don't care whether it's government organizations, you know, different sides of a company, um, people in a project. Um, the, often the weaknesses come out, things fall through the cracks, needless work gets done, or other factors at the interfaces between things. It's really those. At the interfaces that these things occur, um, uh, that that a lot of a lot of issues arise and a lot of um, problems, um, a lot of problems uh, crop up, um, misunderstandings, um, you know, different understandings, the interface with the stakeholder too, right? Um, you you realize, oh, we had understood it differently or what have you, um. Yeah, advantages of doing things early, whether they're inspections or, you know, through spike prototyping um, or clarifying an issue with the stakeholder, right? Or or thinking through a risk. Um, that doing these things early is often um, really valuable to give yourself more lead time if, if, if bad things happen or to, um, uh, to go and... Uh, uh, and and make other choices um, if it turns out a certain line of work is is too difficult or a certain type of work. And, um, 
maybe it maybe because the projects have done pretty well this year, but uh this is pervasive impact of, of quality. Um you know perhaps it was on the first day of class. We talked about the iron triangle. Right? What what's the iron triangle? What are the so a triangle has has three vertices and the three corners. What are what are quality, those corners? Quality, cost, and I'm not sure uh, time. So time and cost. Generally, the, the there are people who put quality on it, but um, scope is generally put on there. Um, sometimes value is put on there. Uh, sort of the value um, delivered, but. Quality, yes, Jesse. Jesse got the point. Quality is at the center of the triangle. And it turns out, you know, the, the iron triangle is often called iron because the idea is it's really hard to get all three. It's really hard to get the scope, you know, and the time, you know, get it within the scope you want, within the time you want, and within the cost you want. And the idea is, look, getting any one of them is trivial, right? Um, uh, you know, I, if I don't care about scope and I don't care about budget, uh, I can do it really quickly because uh, I don't, you know, I just produce almost nothing, right? Um, uh, if I don't care, um, if I if I don't care about time and I don't care about value, um, I could do it really really cheap. Um, and often two of them is feasible. You know, if I don't care about the scope. I could do it within a given cost and within a given budget. Or if I don't care about budget, I can do it within a given time uh, and within a certain scope. Um, but quality is one of those things that helps all three. That's the thing. Yes, if you get quality, you get the others too. You get, you get all three of them. You get scope. You can often achieve the full scope or, or something closer to it or, or deliver the full value or close something to it. You can do it in quicker time because you're not redoing things, and you can often in in you know commercial projects uh, or other larger software projects you can you can do it within a defined budget. You can lower the budget. You can make it cheaper. You can make it fast. Do so faster, and you can deliver more um, because you're not throwing things away. You're not redoing work. Right. You're not misunderstanding requirements and having to throw away the requirement, original description that you came up with and the design that was based on it and the code and the tests and redoing all the, you know, the pull requests you put your time into, et cetera. And, you know, although we don't have time to talk about it, for those who have seen my course in 394, the course in system science, there's, there's this whole sort of system science of projects. And, and you know, th there's a, a very nitty gritty, you know, uh, hard and fast sort of uh, side of this involving software engineering. And there's a lot of nitty gritty stuff. And, and I, I love that stuff. But I also love the fact that, you know, you, I, I also fully recognize and embrace the fact that there's a human theater here. You have to you have to embrace the human element of this too. Um, morale matters, trust matters, respect within teams, you know, conveying respect. Um, uh, understanding struggles matter, understanding conflict matters, right? Um, uh, understanding the stakeholders' impatience in assessing whether they're impatient or not, assessing their level of comfort um, sensing if they're uncomfortable, these things matter. <laughs> they matter for successful delivery, right? Um, so, so those are some overarching, uh, uh, you know, themes here. Um, we talked a lot about best practices here. You know, proactive risk scanning. What, what is risk scanning? What What do I mean by risk scanning? Checking for risks and seeing like uh, in which which part of our program we might uh, the program might fail and if uh, someone like the boss example that he gave us like if someone hits get hit by um, by a boss um, uh, is there someone else 
that can uh, help us uh, or is there someone within the group that can continue the project for us and the development doesn't uh, been pushed away or uh, you know be delayed and also making sure that how much our program is prone to kind of uh, having uh, having the test uh, having like the tests to be filled at the hands of the user like right I'm not say her. that's right um so um so Dan comments evaluating so risk scanning evaluating risks as development of the project proceeds what has changed as the project goes on that's right and I'm looking for two things here um for risk management number one and for risk scanning identifying new risks and identifying cases where previously identified risks are materializing what do we mean by materializing there are like they were there, but uh, you don't, you weren't aware of them that they are there. You, they never been found by you. And then suddenly they are being found. Yeah. So, so when we talk about a risk materialize, I think you got the idea. It actually occurs. It comes about, right? It, 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 it is realized it's, it was a risk, but now it's a problem, right? And today's risk, if we don't handle it, is tomorrow's problem. But fortunately, today's problem is tomorrow's risk. So we can learn from the problems we encounter and we can recognize them as risks in the future. Um, but we prefer that, that today's risk doesn't become tomorrow's problem. Risk scanning is looking for new risks, types of risks, as well as risks that we have previously identified that are coming about. Yeah. Um, uh, we talked about uh, management of them and, and accountable positions. Having people responsible for the dev lead or responsible as the build master or responsible as the as the project manager, responsible as the as the person um, doing risk management or or uh, you know in charge of that, um, who takes responsibility for it, who who has ownership of it. This is this is a, a really important thing. There's a person I can go to who, you know, has ownership of this issue. Um, that's it's a really important notion in these projects, but also in in general, you know, practice um, in in the world. We talked about many types of peer reviews, and you know, one type um, that we really emphasized this semester was pull request peer reviews. Right, doing effective pull requests and. I talked about it a bit in class, but a lot of that feedback was in the form of project meetings, right? Meetings with the project teams. And we said, we, you know, uh, we, we'd like, we need to move beyond reviews of pull requests that says, looks good to me. And, and instead, you know, involve helpful comments or, or note concerns or, or mention opportunities for improving the code or what have you, um, or documentation needs. These are, are really valuable things. But peer reviews come in that spectrum of formality um, from most formal, involving you know, pre-meetings, pre-circulation of materials and, and multiple roles at a meeting, physical meeting or or in any case, synchronous meeting, often a checklist, which you then follow up on. You know, um, that's the most formal inspections. All the way down to, on the other side, you know, very informal processes that are still excellent, 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 often are even more common, right? Peer review and ad hoc, ad hoc tests. I mean, we call them desk checks, but, you know, they're ad hoc. There are ad hoc reviews where we ask someone to look over things. Um, and peer reviews for pull requests are somewhere in the middle, and hopefully they can they can actually be more considered. Um, yeah. You know, um, so if we if we talk about tests um, and inspections, um. Uh, in, in terms of ability to find more bugs, what is 
Does anyone remember what the research says about let me try to try to find products and program really intensively with peer review versus also with a trained team. So peer review, particularly inspection versus with with uh, with tests. What does the literature say about our ability to find bugs? Um, yeah, it, it turns out peer review can find larger fraction of bugs and actually more efficient per hour of time put in. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll come to this notion of offensive programming uh, shortly, but um, that that's exactly right. So peer, um, peer review does find more, but I would argue it's, it's not an either, it's not an either or. They work together, like two wings of a bird, I said, right? To to enable that bird to fly. Um, give me some ways in which peer reviews might might play really well with tests. Or you, you might argue they're synergistic or they're they're complementary, but regardless, um, you know, what are some ways in which they, they really work well together? So if you have the peer, uh, peer review with someone else, you have already, implemented, for example, in your test, they can come over and you actually spread the knowledge in one way. And also you uh, men, you make sure that like when they are saying, OK, uh, did you test it this way? Because you can see and uh, from different views and they'd be like, OK, trace it this way or kind of test it at this level. Did you test it this in different architectures in here mm -hmm. and they help you to kind of uh, see the program or the code that you wrote in other ways and if there is a fatal issue inside that code itself you can actually solve it at the t at the same time you don't have to wait for the test to rerun like for the manual test the advantage is that you know uh, you can watch it as it goes but for the uh, when you have the automation it's, it will be faster but when it fails you need to go ahead and if uh, find out where exactly it is it might take some time to find out yeah um that's okay so um i heard a lot of good things there including that you know you could do peer review on tests um and so on but um uh, i i do want to give a nod to you know matthew pointing out this key thing the tests find failures and reviews find faults reviews find the underlying problem tests find the the symptom of the problem. Uh, and then you can use debugging to find what might have caused that, whereas reviews often point to the, you know, to the underlying problem. It's one of the reasons they're efficient. But but uh, um, so well, wanting to give a nod to that, Artelon is exactly right that we can we can do peer review on testing. Um Eric comments test uh test alert of 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 um of of a problem. So tests can alert to uh to some issue that peer review can help find and fix. Yeah, it's not just debugging, but, but peer review. That's exactly right. Um, uh, and Princess notes, you know, you can check your understanding uh, of the code base in peer review so you can have a better understanding of, of, of that code base. So yeah, peer review builds understanding, right? And it's spread, and I think Ardalan, you emphasize that it spreads knowledge around. Running a test is is great, but it doesn't by itself spread knowledge, right? Uh, it doesn't it doesn't build the awareness. It doesn't build knowledge of stylistic conventions and the you know the the way in which the system is architected and how things should should work together and the ways in which this module is designed to be used and uh, performance concern. These are the sort of things that can come up in in a in a peer review, um, uh, I I I, I want to say um, before we get to a point Ariane has made, which is very uh, important. Um, by testing, we can find things for peer reviews, sort of along the lines of uh, Eric's idea. But while doing peer review, can come up with test case ideas. Yeah, you can. Sometimes there are things in peer review that are that are challenging to fully think through. Um, uh, and you can actually put in place test cases for those, right? You might identify a performance issue, a possible performance issue in, in, in peer review, and then you do a load test and see, you know, how how seriously binding it is. Uh, or peer review brings up a possible concern, um, and uh, testing could could uh, probe. Uh, 
you know, whether or not um, it proves to be uh, an issue in some cases. Um, so it gives ideas for, for test cases sometimes to, to test more fully. Um, Artelon is exactly right. We can review the test cases. Um, and Princess Node improves development process. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it spreads this knowledge. Um, uh, and tests can find vulnerable parts of a system which can be peer reviewed to strengthen them. That's, that's exactly right. There are certain types of testing, stress tests, load tests, which peer review, um, peer review is going to have a hard time matching, right? Like if you want to test those um, non-functional issues of, of performance and how well does it hold up under low memory conditions, low disk space, slow network, um, you have all these interacting systems issues with you know timeouts and, and issues with concurrency, large numbers of users waiting for their operations to complete because the the database is really slow or the network is slow getting to the database. You have all this congestion and, and it's hard to purely reason through all those systems issues. It's all, it's not just one area of code, it's areas of the system. And, and you know, these, uh, uh, in these cases, often peer reviews can identify concerns that are turned into tests, but they, they complement tests at the least. Um, uh, Arian notes, you know, that peer review helps, I, I think what was meant by, you know, evaluate things other than code. This is a key issue that often students um, miss an easy, easy answer on. Um, advantage of peer review. I mean, I can peer review. Give, give me a few doc, uh, a document or two that you could peer review very early in your projects very early like yeah requirements document exactly systems requirements specification um uh, code inspection checklist i love it some architectural design some risk documents database schema i mean these are things you're not going to run a test on them as as much as i love tests you you folks know i i love tests but uh, but you know tests are not the end all right i mean like you can do peer reviews on these. And it's hard to imagine any test being more important than like peer review of a requirements document, right? Like if a requirements document has issues, ain't no test gonna reveal those issues. <laughs> you know, you're not gonna be you're not gonna be running, you know, J unit on your on your requirements document, but you might through inspections bring these issues, you know, bring up these issues and then clarify them with the stakeholder. So absolutely, absolutely key, right? Um, and specifications, yeah, you can peer review. So exactly. Design a requirements document. I hope you realize though, it's not either or, right? Both really work together well. And it's a fool's errand to totally sacrifice one for the sake of the other. Um, uh, can we say that mocking is an individual level review of your code? Well, I wouldn't say it because, I mean, uh, mocking is a tool for effectively um, testing and something in isolation. It's also a tool that can allow you to proceed with development without something in isolation, right? It, it helps um, kind of lower dependencies it's it, it can be formidable also for to help with testing because as princess i think noted much earlier um when you modularize the system you have more of these you know you've a calling instead of a just being a big hairball a can now call b and call call c and can you uh you know uh call d and call e and you can test what's what's being passed at each of those interfaces you can mock out things there and you can have it review different uh, you know or return different values right these are all things that um you could do with with mocking and kind of spy on what's going on so that you can spot behavior that just isn't isn't appropriate if it's a big airball 
it's hard to like look in there. Well, with assertions you could, but but you know, with mocking, it gives you this flexible way of doing it. I wouldn't say it's a level of review because there's no human eyes on it. People aren't learning directly from you know what's happening as the mocking, you know, as the call to the mock is occurring. The process of putting the mocks in place, you might argue, uh, you know, involves some analysis and thinking through. You could say that my reasoning through where the mocks are needed involves a certain degree of kind of discussion and maybe review of the code by someone. Sure. Mm. Um. Uh, incremental delivery. Why do we do incremental delivery? Because it helps us to keep track of the uh, habit progress and get feedback early before something disasters happen. It also helps us to keep track of our own tasks. Like have okay, let's say okay, let's have this feature by the uh, by the end of this, rather than having everything to be moved to the very end that we may want to ship the product. Yeah, um, yeah, you get early feedback. You deliver ongoing value. You avoid a big bang, right? You avoid this thing where everyone puts um puts their code together <laughs> late and it all blows up. Uh, imagine that. Um uh and 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 you can estimate in these smaller chunks. It's really easy to fool yourself when you're trying to estimate eh, three months, four months, five months, one month. I don't know how long it's gonna take. If if you're breaking it into the smaller pieces, it's actually a lot easier to estimate. It delivers ongoing value. The stakeholder can see it. And often it's not clear in the stakeholder's mind until you put something in front of them. That was something I tried to emphasize, you know, like in the opening days of the class. Until they see it, it's hard for them to really conceptualize what they want. Um, not always. You know, you do get you do get cases where you're recreating a system that was there before. They're they're an expert in computer systems, so they they've kind of conceptualized it, but that's comparatively rare. Um, by the way, it is one of the reasons why if, if if any of you go into like certain areas of applications of computer technology world, you can be like you could have like superpowers because you could actually see you actually understand the needs well enough, and you can see what an effective system would start to look like with great clarity compared to someone in that area. And, and you get great advantages for being able to deliver value because it, you, you, um, you make it less a process of kind of groping and, you know, um, you, you can, you can get a certain direction to go. You're much more clearly about where you want to go, um, up front. Um, uh, delivers ongoing value, prevents big bang, decomposition, allows better determination and better estimation, helps resolve risk. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Time box implementation. That's right. You know, limit it. Um, can help you update or fix your development process. That's, that's exactly right. Lead stakeholders to think you. Um, you provide value along the way. Yeah, this is this is an interesting one that Jesse put forward. I, and I, I want to highlight it, not not for the exam necessarily. You know, some, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, some of this is talking about the exam, but I'm trying to also somewhat teach life lessons and this stuff, right? I mean, it's kind of like that in the class, right? As as a whole. So this is an exam review session, but it's also a little bit of a fireside chat about, you know, thinking about these issues, putting them into context, right? Um. Jesse says it can lead to stakeholders to you close to a finished product, leading to a misunderstanding. This is right. And, and that's a really important thing. And I've seen at least one project in my career, probably two, um, um, go in a negative direction when we show a prototype system to a stakeholder um and the prototype consciously was built you know without with knowledge that it wouldn't be scalable it wouldn't be something that was ready for prime time in terms of uh 
uh, the performance side, et cetera. And we show it to a stakeholder and they say, you built it. That's just what I want. You have it. And and then they go try to turn it into the real system without, uh, without you know, that being at all sensible because it's not ready for prime time. Um, and they get into all sorts of trouble because they think the intermediate product is a finished product and they own it and they say, well, it's done. Um, and, and it, it ain't done. <laughs> it ain't done. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, that's that comment about it ain't done to have that discussion requires a technical discussion requires a technically mature sort of discussion of things to them that may be gobbledygook you know it's not scalable it has these security problems you know it 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 it's not going to perform well under stress it's um it, it can't be rolled off out you know for horizontal scaling um it's not going to be able to handle you know uh concurrency effectively or what have you and uh they just see you know something that looks ready yeah um uh yeah, so so um, our, our lines comment. We could talk with teammates, see if something happened. We cannot go in. You can change course. Yeah, so it forces you to change course. Why do we do continuous integration? Can anyone say? We do continuous integration to make sure that you know we can uh, have the have the system running into the main branch and see how it performs in real world, and also if there is a security issue you can also you know figure it out and you can be like okay how we can kind of uh reduce the issue or risk that might happen in the real world because in the test environment um you not all you don't always see all the mm, mm, edge cases but That's having right. it in, in deployed early or having the having it deploying at all you can be like okay how about this how does this work oh yeah this is the issue let's fix it i have the experience so, so I think there are some elements of it. I do want to highlight Ty's key point of it helps pinpoint issues and check-ins, and help, it can help m avoid merge conflicts. Um, you know, I I didn't closely police it this term, but I will in the future. You know, this idea that with appropriate Git flow, I mean, you should be trying to pull pull down updates to 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 master frequently and you should be merging into master very frequently um you should be getting copies of other people's updates and your, your merges into master should be frequent like at the least several times a week um you know having these small small branches ephemeral that 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 go back there um and and having a continuous integration process it's a discipline, right? It it forces your code to undergo style checking. It forces it to undergo uh, being tested with, uh, hopefully you're pulling, you know, with other people's code. Um, helps head off risk, helps test it, right? Against a large number of, of tests and um, helps make sure that other others are getting your contributions frequently you know this this continuous integration right we're integrating it's one of the the reasons it's just so so important that we're we're integrating in master integrating in master frequently um not not pulling things away for weeks at a time and only then integrating which is the prescription for the big bang it's, you know things get incompatible and we try to merge and there's conflicts and it breaks our tests and so on we want to keep those tests up to date, those UI tests, the other tests, uh, et cetera. And it does force te dev to pass the test before continuing development. It's very easy as a developer to just keep on wanting to, cr quote, crank out code where it turns out it's it's not working code. Um, and it does allow, as Aisha points out, it allows for stopping at, at a point in and you know, uh, shipping or showing it to a stakeholder, uh, showing it to others. Uh, 
you're you're continually delivering value, as was said earlier. Um, and the smoke test hopefully is making sure that you haven't totally broken other people's code. You have made the system, you know, um, infeasible to to build. Um, so um, uh, let's see, brief meetings, status updates. I don't think I need to say much more about the value of meeting frequently. Meet early, meet often, um, meet synchronously where possible. Um, we'd be dead without that, right? It's all about this coordination, exchange of information, keeping people updated, spreading knowledge, spreading awareness, spreading um, knowledge of, of needs, right? Um, I hope you're getting the sense of, you know, the vibrancy that projects can have. Um, and and I know projects in this class struggle, but being in a really high quality project, what's called a gelled project, is an exhilarating experience. It's really just a wonderful experience. Um, and not all projects are like that. It's a systems level phenomenon. It's an emergent process. It's it's something bigger than just one person, but it's exhilarating. And I hope you've gotten a glimpse that this is possible through the class. Even if your your particular project didn't get to the point, maybe you see others which did. Um, and it is possible, and it's awesome. And all these virtuous feedbacks apply there, where you know you get these gelled projects where morale is high, where quality is high, where people want to keep on wanting to work there. They, they're not going to walk off to other jobs because they're proud of what they do in a good sense. They are, they're, you know, have uh, the, the, um, the rightful sort of uh, feeling of, of contributing as a craftsman to this. Um, they're very knowledgeable because they've been there a long time. They're spending minimal time, you know, having to, to, to deal with, a coworker who laughs, cut new code, or or you know, to go interview people to hire on, um, because of the high turnover, um, uh, they they have low turnover, and so the morale is high, the code base is of higher quality, the um, the you know these folks can be productive, documentation is kept to a smaller amount, because a lot of people have it in their heads, they're experts in the system. And it's not to say documentation is not important, but if you have people walking out the door frequently, documentation is a lot more important to capture the information that they walked out the door with. If you have people that have been there for a long time, they can up they can onboard people more easily. And being in a team like this often leads to higher quality, you know, higher stakeholder satisfaction. So it attracts the best people in terms of developers and testers. It, it makes the stakeholders really happy. It keeps the team going with high quality, with with effective development and uh, in a fashion that is is higher morale and lower turnover. It's a really exhilarating phenomenon. And I hope you all have a chance to, uh, to you know, benefit from a team environment like this. Um, we talked about design for testability the importance of putting in interfaces that separate from implementation, a dividing a system into modules, often layers, uh, you know, architecturally or, or modules often provide that key link for being able to test things because you can test the modules, right? Um, it has many other virtues too. You can see very clearly what this depends on because they're the things passed in or what it returns, et cetera. But Testability also benefits from specifications, from use of law, multi-level logging, from use of assertions, right? Um, uh, from from mocking frameworks, scripting type platforms, um, and uh, these help foster, um, the you know, help ease testing of your system and reasoning about um, whether it's working or not. We talked quite a bit about test case formulation. Much of the class was about that, and um, it's a key issue. Um, defect estimation um, was something we didn't talk as much about, and you're not really responsible for this semester. Um, 
Uh, yes, modular, you can divide the work up among many people. You can use it uh, uh, for testing other parts. You can replace it without replacing all the features. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, good, I think um, the notion of a spike prototype is something that, that's important. Um, these are throwaway prototypes that often focus on particular risks, right? Resolving risks. I think most of the teams made good use of spike prototypes this year. Um, you know, trying out, seeing how to understand how effective this technology would be in addressing this need in the system, or whether these two technologies uh, work together, play nicely together, et cetera. Um, right. Yeah, so we talked about uh, requirements and um, expectation setting, folks. Um, again, same project, same deliverables, same same timeline can be viewed by a stakeholder as a real success, and and you know treated as a rightfully as a a great you know great outcome, or it could be viewed as as unsuccessful and disappointing, depending on the the expectations they get from the very beginning. So, getting in place effective stakeholder uh, effect expectation management from the start, setting expectations modestly, over delivering rather than under delivering, as a result, uh, is very important. Um, yeah. Um, I, I did provide some suggestions for requirements, you know, this idea of structured elicitation, repeating back what you hear from a stakeholder, rephrasing it. And and when I say repeating back, often it's rephrasing of it and, and, and saying it back to them. Asking them to say it again could be good, but there's a risk that they'll use the same technical jargon. And you want to generally put it into your own words and see if you've got it. Um circulating it in written form early, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, specifications. One thing I I did emphasize at one point, but I want to hit on here. Let's suppose we have a function and I put in place preconditions, postconditions to that function. I'm going to call that an abstraction. I, I Here it's a function. It could be a class, right? where we provide more information like history, properties, and invariants too. But, but let's suppose it's a function for now. So, so we have this function. And there's clients who use that function, other code that calls that function. And then there's, you know, the folk and, and creators of that code that calls it. And then there's creators of this abstraction itself, of the function. And I would argue, I submit to you, that that both those groups benefit from specifications for that function. Why do the folks who use that function benefit from specifications? They can use, so Glenn says, the users of the abstraction can use the specification to know what they can count on. Yeah, they can count on um, uh, that, um, I, and it says this never has a null value that, so so the user of the abstraction would know like um if i call this with non null values for these arguments and where j is must be at least as big as i or i and j have to be greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to size of the array or whatever it will it will return for me an array you know from uh from original index j i to original index j or what have you um, the point is, they know what the abstraction promises, and they can count on that remaining the case, even as the implementation of the abstraction evolves. They can count on this behavior. It's a contract, just like if you have a contract with, you know, uh, uh, a a company to uh, build your house, um, or to buy a car you um you, you know that the folks in the company the particular people delivering on that may come and go the contractor may hire different subcontractors um or the 
Um, the company that's selling you the car may hire Joe to drive it here or Jane to drive it here, whatever. It, that's all implementation detail. You don't have to get involved with that. What you have is a contract that, you know, this car will be ready for your pickup for this amount of money at this time. And those implementation details are their business. The contract separates you from that and knows what you can count on. And when we have an abstraction, it provides enduring ability to count on certain things. That if I call it with these sort of things, it will return that or it will do this for me, that it will do this job. That's what the users of the abstraction count on, even as the, the implementers of the abstraction evolve the implementation, even as they change how it's implemented, whether it uses bubble sort or quick sort or whatever, right? By contrast, the 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 folks so so the users benefit from the specification of that function provided. Um, but the folks who build that function, who implement that function, also benefit from the specification. Why did the folks why do the folks who create that abstraction benefit from it? Uh, they benefit from it by, you know, when you are cre uh, creating something in the future that they want to add to it for future development, they know that they can count on. So, for example, one of the examples we gave was uh, having a, a class of fruit and having like banana, apple, and other fruits in there. You know that uh, if you give it, for example, cheese, it's not going to work. You know, uh, it's going to help you like when you're uh, actually building other parts of the system that is depending on it to make sure that okay. it's not going to give you that okay yeah so, so so that's a good point i mean like if i create if i'm the creator of that of that um abstraction you're absolutely right that that i i i know um what i can count on that like this argument you know um is a sorted list not any old list it's a sorted list or that this value passed to me um is not null or this one is, you know, um, this value i is in the range between zero and the length of the array minus one inclusive or something like that. I I, I know that. And so, um, and I know that's going to be in, going to stay the case because it's part of the abstraction that this value is in this range, et cetera. And I know that um, I'll, I can count on it when, when, you know, uh, when implementing the code. But not only that, I know what can change. I know what I haven't promised to. Like, for example, it may be that, you know, I um, am passed a value and I return, so it's an array and I return a sorted ver version of that array, right? Um, but I'm not promising what algorithm I use to sort it right that that's up to me all i promise is that it's a sorted array i return and i know therefore you know i can choose which one now it can be more subtle than that for example i might say okay i'm past an array and uh it's not sorted but if there's two items in that array of equal value at um relative positions you know i and j where i is less than j so one occurs before the other even though they're they're, they're at the same value maybe they're at different places in the original array it's unsorted after all one is happens to be before the other maybe i want to return an array where it's sorted but they're guaranteed to be in the same order preserve that order um if i provide that as part of my specification i know okay i can only I can evolve the implementation. I can change what sort I use as long as I guarantee that. So a specification gives the creator of the abstraction freedom by saying, look, you can innovate within these bounds. You know, as long as you keep true to what you've promised in the specification, I can change the implementation. I don't have to worry that somewhere somebody is counting on some subtle feature of my implementation because anything that's not promised by me, they should not be counting on. That's the deal with the specification, 
right? It's a contract. And the user of it shouldn't be counting on something that's not guaranteed by it. Um, they shouldn't be counting, oh, it's going to preserve the order of things. Um, if they are, they're on a fool's errand because it's it's not part of what's guaranteed. Um, but it does make clear what they can't count on. The, the return thing is sorted or what have you. So, so what I'm saying is that contracts, while they sound like they're limiting, they actually give freedom to to the creator because it it gives them a sense of what they can evolve safely without breaking the code of anyone is, who's using that thing because people are warned you know count on the things that are provided in the specification nothing else conversely it gives freedom to the users of the class because they can relax they know that certain things are guaranteed to them um even as they update to newer versions of this library, these things will hold true. And it gives them that freedom to update without that worry that it's going to break their code. They don't have to worry that they have to go back and you know retest their code against this new implementation because it might have changed whether it's a sorted list returned or not. No, they know what they can that they can guarantee. So what I'm saying is this sort of use of specification, these contracts gives benefits to both the users users of the abstraction the people who use it and the creators of the abstraction do, do people understand that point are you comfortable with that point it is one of the many joys of abstraction as tony says yes yes that's exactly right um yeah this this term we didn't talk I, I would have loved to have talked about how contracts and specifications are formulated for object-oriented systems with classes. We have what are called history properties and invariants. And you get into the Liskov substitution principle with subtyping, polymorphism. It's really interesting stuff. And if you go back, you'll find probably 10 videos of me talking about it online. Um, and, you know, I'll, um, but this, term I that was part of my you know willing to trade silver for gold to have that dialogue um yeah so here are some more here are some more you know benefits I I think assertion checks should be clear to all of you I mean like if you if you have preconditions and post conditions like they're just crying out for assertions they just yearn to be checked in an assertion, right? Um, uh, you can mock things out. You can confirm that the preconditions are, are being observed when you call this mock, et cetera. Um, make sure you return something that meets the post condition. Um, you can start writing code against this thing, uh, you know, before before the, the code exists, right? Um, uh, early on, you could start writing code because you know basically what it, what it needs and what it guarantees. Mm. I, you know, I kind of wave my hands at fox, the fake mocks and stuff. The idea is that mocks often do a bit more checking, et cetera. Yeah, so Glenn, don't worry about let's go substitution principle for, for this term. Um, it's, it's, it's a thing I love covering but I gave it up and I gave it up, ladies and gentlemen, for you to have those dialogues with you. Truly, it was it was a it was a conscious uh, decision. Um, probably a good one um, in light of people feeling they they benefited from from that dialogue. Um, yeah. What's the difference in faking and stubbing? Yeah. What I was saying is, look, um, fakes generally return trivial values they're the, fakes are viewed as kind of or the the kind of the vernacular i've heard is fakes are are kind of unintelligent mocks they're kind of forgive the term but dumb mocks they're they're kind of mocks that are that that are unimaginative and unintelligent um, in what way? Well, 
um, mocks, so fakes generally, okay, so you have some placeholder code. That's what a stub and fakes are. They're, they're pretty much, stubs are, 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 were the much older term for when you had like a function or a method, a particular method or function. You can mock out a whole class. I wouldn't call that a stub so much. A stub is like the a fake of a function, a fake of a method. I'd call it, I might call a stub, but I'd call it a fake as well. And the deal is that, look, when it serves the same function, general function as a, the same general role it plays as a mock, but it doesn't do the sort of checking. It's not intelligent like a mock. Um, so if you have a class A, or sorry, a, a method A, and it calls off to methods B, C, and D, this could be a function, right? Calls functions B, C, D. Um, a fake would would fake out B, C, D. So it's placeholder code, right? It's kind of dummy code, right? And I I I call it. Um, uh, but it, yeah, I mean, look, that's, that's one definition. There's different vernaculars for these. Um, uh, but basically, you know, you call off to these things. Um, so a, if, if it were just a, what I call a stub or what I call a fake, it would call off to B and it will return a value, uh, B will return back. But it's not doing anything particularly sophisticated. It just returns some legitimate value. But it's not doing any checking. It's not doing any evaluation of properties. Um, uh, and, uh, and and Glenn's definition, okay, a fake does a bit more work. So maybe it's maybe it does a particularly simplistic algorithm. It does a brute force search, or it does a, you know, it. It, it performs a really, really slow uh, algorithm for it, um, but one that that works. Uh, you could you could put it that way. It's just kind of a it's sort of a an intermediate version that's not yet ready for prime time, but it it does some functionality. Generally, I I use stub and fake. I mean, a, a stub is sort of a fake at a function or method level. Um, now, a mock is something more than this. A mock for these things, it can, it can do testing. It can do extra level of evaluation of certain properties. For example, maybe, maybe you're mocking out the initialization method. So you have a function A and it calls off to B, C, and D. And maybe B is init, init you know, initialize, right? And maybe it should only be called once by A. Something a mock might do is Keep track how many times has it been called. And if it's called more than once, throw an assertion. I'd say, whoa, you know, this is being used illegally, right? This is being used improperly. Or maybe it maybe it's maybe C is something which takes some values passed to it by A. And one of those values we know, because this is specification, is not allowed to be null. So maybe it'll check, is it being passed something that's null? Or maybe it's more intelligent than that. Maybe maybe it knows an array being passed to it has to be of length greater, has to be non-null and of length greater than zero or greater than whatever. Um, it can check that. Maybe it's being passed integers i and j, and it knows both of them have to be greater than zero. And maybe it knows I has to be less than or equal to J, and it can check that. So a mock may have this ability to check properties that help confirm, like it's like put in place assertions that confirm that it's being used correctly. Um, and it might do something more intelligent for the return value too. Um, and maybe it can return somewhat more sophisticated data structures or something. So here, um, 
it's it's kind of like an intelligent fake, an intelligent, um, intelligent um, uh, sort of testing tool, an intelligent doppelganger, an intelligent um, sort of placeholder. Um, I think Glenn's definition is is uh, there. It's it's one of several I've seen. Um, and again, these are terms which have evolved over decades. Um, uh, but uh, it's it's a good one. It's a thoughtful one. Um, so this idea of kind of some things are kind of not fully baked, but they're basically a working implementation, just particularly simple. Um, we talked about fault feedback ratio. What's a fault feedback ratio? Can anyone say? So if there is a um, issue in the system or an error in the system, how uh, what we can do, and we didn't figure it out, what we can do to actually, you know, we could have discovered it sooner and what we can do to, you know, uh, not let that happen, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay, but so generally that's the area of it, but it's specifically the number of errors introduced per attempted fix. Yeah. Um, so the number of, bad fixes over the number of total fixes or total attempted fixes. Yeah. Um, like one of the things in the numerator may be I attempted a fix, but it failed. Right. And, um, uh, and, and, uh, I would still count it in the denominator. Um, uh, cause I, I attempted the fix, but, um, but I've introduced an error. So, um, but, uh, often we, we have quite a fault feedback ratio. We we try something and sometimes we succeed, but a lot of the times we don't. So a fault feedback ratio of 50%, five zero, is not that uncommon. Um uh and and why is that important? Yeah, like if I fix 50, I introduce 25 new bugs. Or I attempt to fix 50 and I introduce 25. Yeah, defects. That's right. New bugs. Why? Why is? Why could that be a problem? This may sound like really highfalutin. Why? Why is that a problem? It may sound arbitrary. Yeah, Ty is exactly right. The defects, the new defects, may not be known. Is that possible? that the new defects are worse than the thing you fixed? Could that be? Yeah, it's a risk of test escape. It could get, what's a test escape? Can anyone tell me? If uh, a actually test... that, uh, that bug goes out of your test program and gets to the user, it can yes. affect the user, yes. their user features that they are depending on it. And they yeah. are, like, we don't want to use this program because we, it is not reliable. Yeah, it's not reliable. It's giving the wrong numbers. It's giving the wrong results, right? Imagine that. Um, yeah, that that's a serious, serious. Imagine like your tax preparation program gives wrong, <laughs> wrong numbers <laughs> for them to fill out for their taxes. I'm laughing, but that's not a that's not a good thing. Um, we're doing taxes here, doing taxes right now, and I do not want to be given the wrong numbers to tell CRA. Or to tell U.S. tax authorities, um, I do not want that. But like an audit declared because because a, a program gave the wrong answer, and the users of the Beep Engine don't want to get wrong results right out of it. Don't want to write papers and only be told later, uh, yeah, like those wrong results were wrong. You know, you don't want that. Yeah. So, so here's the thing, um, um. With with these errors, they can be they can lead to test escapes because you might not have time to find them before it's released. This is a big, big, big danger. You understand that? It's a big danger if you 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 try to fix a bug, and then you say, "Okay, fix, let's ship it," and it turns out you introduced another one, and you don't have a workaround for it. You don't have documentation on it. It may give the wrong answer. Right? Um, that's really bad. And also, if you need to take, if you really need to take time to figure out, did it introduce a new bug? That's going to take time, right? 
You're going to run your regression test suite. You're going to run other, other tests. Maybe you'll undertake the manual tests and you may say, we don't have time for this. And you're rolling the dice. You've traded the devil you know potentially for the devil you don't know, right? You're not sure um, if you're going to get one. And and that leads you to be cautious, right? It leads you to be circumspect and and, and to be, um, uh, you know, uh, judicious. Sometimes we leave thing, we leave a, a defect in. We, we want to fix it. We think we could fix it, but we leave it in because we're afraid if we try to fix it, it'll end up breaking and, and, and who knows what, what we'll get. Or if we're going to fix it, what do we do? What do we do if we're, we're going to say, okay, we're going to try to fix this thing. What do we need to do? What's our, what's a game plan that might help reduce the risks if we're going to fix it? Oh, that's a good idea. Put a preacher switch uh, around it so you can turn it off flexibly. I love it, Ty. I love it. That's awesome. We've gotten a bunch of good comments in, Ty. Much appreciate these. Um, uh, yeah, you, I mean, at the least you want to do versioning. But look, if you're going to try to fix that, you want to take it really seriously. You want to get the people who are most familiar with this code and with interfacing pieces of code and you really want to study this thing, probably do a peer review of it, right? Like a formal inspection or, or formal analysis in order to figure out, you know, how do we fix this? How do we fix it safely? What are the possible implications? And, and yeah, you make an evaluation of it. I, although it's, again, one of the things that's hard here is like, if we fix it, what are the potential implications of any other thing we we really want to think that through. How could the fix go wrong? What would it mean if the fix goes wrong? Um, and th these are all uh, important, um, important, uh, you know, types of of concerns. Um, so, uh, you know, you, defects um, that are going to be fixed, you have to be incredibly careful, and. If possible, you'd like to be able to fix it only, you know, and and have time to test it. And there was a comment in here: code freeze uh, reduces the chance. Yes, exactly. So if the code freeze in place, and that buys time to to get, excuse me, maybe a few more cycles of testing in before you ship, before you give it to the to the user, right? Before you 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 you're you're you 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 um before it goes golden golden and and you you're uh you produce it um the final product so you hopefully get a few more iterations testing debugging fixing and testing again right um to make sure you haven't you know re recreated that uh bug and it's one of the reasons why when you fix bugs you want to put in place a test that confirms that and it goes then in your regression test suite. So if that defect ever reappears, for example, for a merge conflict and it gets back in there or the same logical mistake or whatever, it gets found as, as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, test escapes. Yeah. Um, I argued that testing is more than finding bugs. Why is that? What what else does testing give you? It sometimes helps you to know the limit of your program. Like it helps you to understand what are the limitation of your system so you can have a better documentation. And also if this project fail or this program failed, you can actually use the experience for the next project so that that one doesn't uh, lead to the same uh, kind of ending if it ended badly. Kind of a learning, that's right. question, I would say. That, that's right, that's right. Um, testing improves processes, yeah. Reflecting on, on the things that crept through 
lets you ask, how can we improve our processes even better so these sort of defects are less likely to be found? If you find a defect, well, we didn't get a chance to, to talk about this. It's actually a, a fascinating thing. It's one of, alas, the, the triage um, uh, the thing I would have, would have shown. Um, uh, often testing occurs in spurts. And, and what I mean by that is you find a defect and you should be thinking like, what other types of defects might be out there that we could find now? So we know this type of defect, we found it. Are there any others in the database or in the code base like this? And you start looking guided by this idea of, you know, this um, this one that you saw. It gives you ideas for others. It gives you ideas for new tests you can put in place for others, right? You should be asking, how can we prevent things like this from happening in the future? What what innovations the process? What innovations to our test process? We could find them sooner. So often you end up finding, um, uh, you end up finding these things uh, in uh, in kind of spurts. You end up, um, uh, you know, tracking them down um, in. Um, uh, in these uh, kind of um, bursts that you, you realize there's a certain type of bug and uh, and you end up um, uh, discovering uh, sort of a whole class of bugs, et cetera. And um, I might be able to actually show you something that I would have, uh, yeah, it's this one here. Oh, it's really, really a, a lot of, lot of fun. Um, Alas, if only um, if only I had uh, had time to to go through this. Um, okay, there we go. Um, mm, um, so, anyone want to guess what are what do these things remind you of? What what sort of thing might this be referring to? This is from an actual organization. It's a very large and famous organization. Anyone want to guess what organization is? NASA. You got it. These are, right? These are our probes, right? Um, planetary, but now interstellar, right? Voyager is traveling out of the solar system. Um, it's traveled quite a distance, I think, beyond... Pluto and 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 uh, Neptune's orbits and so on. Now these are these are space probes. These are weeks of testing. So what's one week or what's one year here? Anyone tell me what's one year? Yeah, it's like like here, right? These are years. These are the number of defects found per thousand lines of code, and the code bases for each of these. These code bases are still running. Voyager is still sending things. It's getting very little sunlight, very little sunlight. It's so distant from the sun, but occasionally it chirps, right? Keeps them and it sends a message. It did it within the past month, I think. So these are code density or de defect density found. Anyone notice a couple patterns with these? Some What's something? Yeah. I saw the bugs or defects that they found, like um, sometimes they actually still continue and grow. Some of them it started to kind of after some time to actually kind of stay stable. Yeah. So so one thing that was mentioned by Daniel um, and by Artelon is you got these flat areas. What what would a flat area here, a horizontal area, what does that mean in 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 kind of lay terms? Just translating the graph, interpreting the graph. What what would that mean? Nothing is found during that time. No new defects are found, right? But you'll notice there's something else going on with these curves. Do you notice it? What what does this jump mean? Or what would this jump mean? Or what would this jump mean? Or 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 this one here? It means mm -hmm. that they try to introduce a new feature, and at that time they found new defects. No, 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 no. These are fixed code bases. I should have emphasized no new features being added. Oh, okay. No new features over this entire time. Yeah, the spurts, the spurts. And what are the spurts? 
they're 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 probably discoveries of common classes of defects, right? So they 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 probably they kind of plateaued for a while. They didn't find any, and then they discovered like a bunch of defects. It actually leaf led it from like four defects per thousand lines of code to five per thousand lines of code. Again, no new features are being added over these times. So they they discovered this. The, the, this group of defects and then it kind of plateaued and then they discovered a bit more and then they plateau and then it discovered a bit more and it discovered a bit more uh -huh. how many years is is like 253 roughly this area roughly how many years is it about five years same code base finding defects When it rains, it pours. They find a bunch because they're probably pretty similar. You know, oh, there's memory leak. Where, where else might there be memory leaks? Oh, there's this issue with buffer overwrites or whatever. You know, where, where else might um, uh, there might be? There might be, yeah, uh, duplicates of this code or you know, similar uses of how the code is is. Um, uh, failing to properly release memory or whatever, um, or how it's not it's it's not properly reacting to a certain sensor, um, and it maybe applies to different sensors. The point is that um, defect, like learning from defects, is really important. Just like Aisha said, much of life is about learning from our mistakes, right? And and a mistake can yield net negative uh, net positive outcomes if we learn from it, take it to heart, and do and 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 learn to avoid similar mistakes uh, in the future, head off similar mistakes in the future. It can be a step forward. We we've, we've ended up the better for it. Right? We've headed off all these future mistakes by making this one mistake. We can learn how in the future to avoid those mistakes or how to spot them if we have made them as soon as possible so we can course correct. And those NASA numbers are an indication of a learning organization trying to learn from these mistakes, trying to capitalize on these mistakes, quickly correct you know, others like them. They're on a roll, right? They're, they're learning from them, putting their heads together. What can we learn? And that's something that I hope all of you will take away from this course. It's an opportunity to reflect honestly on mistakes as a group where possible, as an individual, uh, you know, as, as appropriate, and, and to learn from them and commit to heading issues off, you know, avoiding similar things in the future or, or discovering them, them quicker. And so discovering bugs just like discovering problems in life are an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to success. They're an invitation to success. And I hope that this class, ladies and gentlemen, can be an invitation to you to success. Um, I could go on. There's, there's any number of different lines of material, um, but realistically, we're only going to be able to uh, cover a fraction of it. And I think I haven't done badly by covering an important, prominent fraction here. So are there any final questions? We're over time by, you know, over 40 minutes. Are there any final questions that I could answer before I, I, I bid you my leave and uh, we both prepare to see each other tomorrow morning, uh, somewhat before uh, nine o'clock? Am I able to speak on the weighting of different various question types? Um, uh, yes, you can submit the personal postmortems as well as the group postmortems until midnight tomorrow night. So that's uh, midnight at the end of tomorrow night. Uh, um, can I speak on the weighting of various question types? Um, um, so... Um, you know, I, I can make some 
general utterances to this effect. Um, larger questions have larger number of points associated with them. Smaller questions like true false tend to have comparatively small points. Fill in the blank, comparatively small, maybe a bit more. Short answer, larger, larger yet, larger, a bit, bit larger, so small to medium, larger questions, more points. That being said, um, cover to take a pie chart and summarize the points on the exam devoted to large to longer questions. For, you know, for each of those question categories, the large questions would be of that pie chart of marks attributed to these different types of questions, the maximum marks you could earn for each of those types of questions. The larger questions would, would be a, a small fraction, certainly no more than a quarter of the total exam marks. I think a quarter is on the, on the upper side of it. So if a student uh, were to take the exam and not fill in the large questions at all, could they still pass? Most affirmatively, they could. They could certainly pass. Um, uh, so, it, you know, there is this escalating level, but it's not exponentially escalating. It's um, not not at all. Um, it's, I would say, fairly fairly modest uh, escalations. Yeah, hope that's helpful. Um, for AES students, um, uh, there's a question. Um, for AES students, do, you, do I want you to come early? I mean, um, it would be helpful if you were there 10 minutes before, something like that, but not half hour before. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe a quarter before. It's, it's probably okay, but um, I need to uh, I need to play multiple roles in in both the uh, larger labs uh, as well as the uh, um, the breakout rooms. And normally I've kicked off the exam in the larger labs uh, so that everyone, including the AE, the students with AES accommodations, can hear my descriptions of the exam. And then uh, I, I walk with the AES students over to the breakout rooms. That's normally my modus operandi in, in these cases. Um, Partly because I'm dealing often with the tech staff in the main rooms and uh, coordinating with the uh, other invigilators and and so on. Um, so I'm I'm not actually sure that coming early is going to confer uh, too much benefit. It may be that you just wait uh, a bit longer. Please, 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 per my note, uh, my my remarks in the announcement. Please be sure to bring your um, devices for two-factor authentication. You will be required to leave any items at the front of the room, and that includes those devices. Um, so uh, you will use that in an ephemeral way to get through the two-factor authentication, have to put it away, and have to put it at the front of the room. Yeah, Be sure before you leave. To sign the um, sign the sheet, the tally sheet, uh, put down your name and your uh, student ID, a student number. Yeah. So you should have your student number with you too. Okay. Um, any final questions? Okay. Folks, it's been a real pleasure. Um, oh, will dictionary be allowed? Ooh. Um, I would say 
Uh, I would say no. Um, uh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, hmm. Yeah, the problem is, is that it is it only a dictionary um, when students use it? I would say uh, by default, no. Um, I tend to answer a, a lot of questions about wording during these exams. Students are not shy generally about asking me, what do I mean by X? So if I use the word materialize, some a student may ask me, what do I mean by that? And, you know, generally I'm accommodating for those things. Now, clearly, if you ask me, you know, what do you mean by risk scanning? When I say, please define risk scanning, if someone were to say, what do you mean by risk scanning? I, I can't answer that. I'm not going to answer that. But if it's a word used kind of in a passing fashion in another question, I I will generally answer and I'll answer. I, I try to take note of these things and uh, and then go to each venue and convey those answers to the students in each and every place. So that would be the four breakout rooms in the two labs. That's part of my kind of rounds. I, I just go around and I convey the answers I imparted one place to others. You know, clarify things, et cetera. And I ask, does anyone have any questions? So yeah. Um yeah, I wouldn't worry about spelling as long as the, you know, as as long as it's pretty clear. I'm not gonna mark off for spelling. Um, um as long as it's not like yeah, yeah. I mean, if you misspell, like, uh, if you misspell a function name foobar as, you know, um, you know, uh, hello, I, then, then it'll be confused. But I think, you know, for sort of localized spelling issues, I, I'm not worried about it. Don't worry about that. It, it'll be, it'll be communicated. Yeah, yeah. So don't worry. And I wouldn't look up in a dictionary for spelling names. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any final questions? Um, uh, yes, yes. Uh, so, um, y yes, there's, there's some, um, what I would call code. Uh, so, Taya just asked, will any code be required? Well, Look, I mean, um, again, I'm I'm not going to ding you on syntax, um, but I need to understand what it means. Uh, so I'm not going to say like you forgot a semicolon or you know, um, wh where have I seen this before? Um, uh, Uh, sorry. Um, for some reason I'm not. Um, yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, this did come up at one point, um, in recent years in a surprising way. Generally, I'm not going to ding you for like syntax problems, but I I do expect you to do expect you to understand syntax, and I expect you to be able to write something that's clear. Um, in terms of its use of that syntax. Um, Yeah, so so for example, if I'm asking you to write something in Java, um I don't expect it to look like Fortran or something. Um I expect you to know how to call a a method on an object. 
um, or how to pass a parameter and an argument. <laughs> you are, you know, you're in the software development program, so presumably you you can write code for me that that looks um, that that looks like passable things and. And um, I think you folks know it. You know, I often for a type language, I I use Java examples. So, you know, I I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna test. You're like, okay, you need to know how to import things and you know declare a iterator for a loop or something like that, or you know, be testing your your knowledge of how to use how to delegate to the constructor of a super class or some 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 sort of quasi like you know quasi um sophisticated thing like that but i like i i expect you to like be able to look at some code and know the syntax and to write to me syntax that i can understand properly um and I'm not going to be looking for ways to ding you, you know, for for wrong syntax. But if if it's like so wild, I don't know what it means. Um, you, you know, you the mark given will reflect that. Um, I don't know if I'll say the mark is wild. You don't know what it means. I think you'll know very well what it means. Um, but uh, you know, there have been times where like. I'm like, what's that? Like, like what? It's it just, it's just wild stuff, and I don't want to be told like, uh, like, oh, I was actually writing it, and yeah, I was putting it in prologue, or I was, you know, I, I was writing it in Perl or something like that. Um, um, I was using COBOL, um, to encode it. No, I mean, like, I expect, look, you're software engineering students. I expect you to be able to tell me pretty clearly. And Java like by you know what you're trying to trying to do um in something. And um uh, and uh you know, as long as that just like with spelling errors, as long as that communication is there, I'm not gonna ding you on the small things. I'm looking for you to engage with the substantive type of issues uh you learned in, in class. Yeah, but language, whether human or computer in nature should not be a you know foremost uh in in impediment um you know as long as it's clear one way or, you know what is meant i'm i'm okay and as long as what is meant is is the sensible thing yeah okay we're coming up at three hours now for what was billed as a two-hour session and i have major amounts of work to do on this and other fronts um, for, for today. So I think uh, I will um, uh, bid you farewell and wish you well and uh, look forward to seeing you shortly before nine o'clock in S320. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, best of luck with uh, studying. Yeah, thanks. Take care there, everyone.